Hello everyone, welcome to my study and to Dongit's Model Railway. The last piece of track I laid on this layout was this double junction, which is now in a mildly awkward place at the back of the layout with a lot more stuff built around it. I need to install point motors and wire up the power to this area. These are the point motors I use. Let me zoom in on this a bit. They are slow action motors which use a standard 9G micro servo. The servo is mounted in a 3D printed frame. The kit of parts, the frame and all the required pieces for assembly other than the servo itself is available from Merg as a kit. The motor uses a piece of piano wire to move the tie bar. You can see here how a lot of servo movement produces a relatively small amount of tie bar movement. Slow action point motors require that the tie bar spring of the point is removed. On a code 75 pico point, this is done from above by removing this piece of the point and lifting the spring out. This is unlike code 100 points which would have to be lifted off the baseboard to do this. Naturally, because I'm me, this is the hardest possible case for a double junction. I have electrofrog points and an electrofrog diamond. I need full block detection, including detecting the diamond separately. I have ABC braking across the junction in all mainline travel directions, and I want to avoid using a short detection auto reverser as well. With the spring removed, the tie bar is not retained in any position and must be held in place by the motor. I can mount these motors either way round. A test fit in the target location will confirm if there's space to mount them side by side facing the same way, or if I should turn one of them around the other way. While I'm in here, I can mark the screw positions and create pilot holes to make final assembly much easier. Using an awl like this, it's very easy to make an initial detent into the baseboard, which a self-tapping screw will catch into. The screw holes where the motor attaches to the baseboard are slotted in the kit to allow some fine adjustment once installed, but it's still important to get these in the right location. If they're not the correct distance apart, you won't have much in the way of adjustment available. This is the track plan of the area. Overlaid here is how the DCC bus needs to be wired when the turnouts are straight, and this is how the DCC would need to be wired when the turnouts are curved. The green sections are where the polarity needs to change. The frog of each point can be driven from a switch on the point motor as per normal. But there is no motor for the diamond, so we will have to do something else. I've decided not to drive the diamond with a short detecting auto reverser, but instead from additional sets of switches on the point motors. I can mount up to two sets of switches on each motor easily. Three sets is much more of a challenge and would require modification. It looks tempting to just wire the leftmost frog of the diamond directly to one of the other frogs on the turnouts and use a mirror image set of switches on the same point motor for the other frog. While this would work fine if you were doing a plain DCC installation, unfortunately for me this isn't appropriate as I need to detect occupancy and control ABC for the diamond crossing separately to the two turnouts. This means that the feed wires for the diamond need to come from different track circuit detectors and braking generator channels so they cannot be wired together after the polarity switching. I will also need to control braking for the diamond in both directions, which is not true for either turnout, which will only be traversed in one direction each. The ABC braking boards I use on this layout are custom designs that I had made for me by my channel sponsor, PCBWay. They have a Christmas sale on for the duration of December with a lot of interesting discounts. It looks like a great time to get into creating your own PCB designs. Perhaps you have an idea to simplify a wiring task on your own layout, and a custom-made basic PCB is just the thing you need. Perhaps you have a more complex project in mind, and need something with surface mount component assembly, or perhaps even a flexible PCB. Or maybe you want something 3D printed or CNC machined. They can do that too. Check out the website at the link below, have a look through the discounts, and see what they can do to help you with your projects. Back to the task at hand. How do I need to wire these up? 
When both turnouts are straight, I need the leftmost frog of the diamond to be red and the other frog of the diamond to be black. When both turnouts are curved, the leftmost frog needs to be black and the other frog red. If the outermost tracks are selected, no train will be crossing the diamond. I don't actually care which way round the frogs are wired, or even if they're in a consistent state, or connected at all, provided that no shorts are caused in this configuration. If both turnouts head towards the diamond, we have bigger problems than just what polarity the frogs should be. Like, why are two trains both heading to the same location in opposite directions? The real railway prevents the points from ever getting into this situation in the signal box interlocking. This is called flank protection and ensures that any overrunning trains do not collide with each other should they fail to stop before the junction. I will also apply this concept to my model, preventing the points from being set into this configuration in the interlocking. Thus I don't really have to worry about what happens to the diamond in this case. I'd still like it not to cause any shorts, but just like the split case, it could be an inconsistent state or not connected at all, and that would actually be fine. From this I have determined that I can use either or both of the turnouts to drive the frog polarity, as the only two relevant cases are where both turnouts are straight, or both turnouts are curved. I can mount up to two sets of switches on each turnout, and one set on each is in use for driving its own frog, so I will use one set on one turnout, and the other set on the other turnout. This will leave the diamond in an inconsistent state, either two reds or two blacks, when the points are set in different directions. As there will never be a valid move across the diamond, in either of these cases, I don't mind. I've also made sure that there will never be any shorts created purely from the position of the points. One question that I've flip-flopped on a number of times is whether this particular section break is necessary. I don't want to throw current detectors and ABC generators at tiny bits of track unnecessarily, and every train that crosses this junction has to continue into the block section immediately. There is no case where a train will be allowed as far as the end of the junction, but not into the track beyond it, and there is also no signalled move for a train running wrong line at this location to come back out. This would suggest that I don't actually need this section break. However, because I'm going to use flank protection on this junction, this particular break does turn out to be necessary. Let's say I first move a train across the junction in this direction into this block, and afterwards I want to move a train across the junction in this direction down towards the storage yard. I must change the upper point to provide that flank protection for the move across the junction, even though the train will only cross the lower point. In order to change the upper point, I need to know that the wheels are clear of the point plates. It would also be important to know that the rear of the train has moved off the junction to know it's not fouling the adjacent line. I don't want to have to wait for the first train to clear a complete block section further ahead. Just properly into this block section should be sufficient, and that's why I do need this section break. I've drawn out the diagram on paper, including how the switches are wired to the track to assist when wiring this up. I'm going to wire up as much as I can here on the bench, as it's much easier working here than under the baseboard. Once on the layout, each block section will require a red and black block wire back to the electronics. I've added a second set of micro switches to these two point motors already. These are push to make switches and one each side is required to set the polarity at each end of the tie bar throw. While the point is in motion the frog is completely disconnected. The third pin of the switch is not connected internally and will not be used. I'm using the same single core wire here that I use for dropper wire. I will attach these wires to the block wires in the same way I do normal droppers. I can get away with using single core as this is a fixed layout. If this was a portable layout, I would not want to use this amount of solid core wire and would be using mostly stranded wire so that it will cope better with being handled and moved about. While you're watching me wire these point motors up, can you please check your subscribe to the channel? The button is right below the video. And if you like the video, finding it useful, there's a handy button for that too. If you think I failed at explaining something properly, or you need some clarification on something, write me a comment and I'll do my best to answer it for you.
With the wiring of the switches now complete, let's move these to the underside of the baseboard. Having made a pilot hole with the awl earlier, getting the screws started is much easier than it would have been without it. However, there's still a bit of difficulty here with the closeness of the baseboard below. Apologies for the video quality under here. While editing it, I've noticed it looks like there's some kind of interference between the LED work lights I'm using and my phone camera. Unfortunately, at this time of year and in a north facing room, it's very difficult to find time to work in natural light that's good for filming. I hope the interference pattern is not too distracting and I'll try and avoid this in future. I'm being careful here to line the motors up precisely so the tie bar is as close to centered as I can get it with the motor also centered. That way I have the highest chance of not needing to adjust the position of the motor later. To finish physical installation, the piano wire needs a 90 degree bend in it. The end of the wire goes into the point motor frame, providing the lower pivot point. The wire protrusion above the track is set by the position of this bend. You want it tall enough so that it never disengages from the point at any point in its motion, but short enough so that it never fouls anything passing above the point. The Electrofrog Diamond has four wires coming through the baseboard, and I can never remember which one is which. I'm going to use a multimeter on continuity setting to identify which set of rails correspond to which of the four dropper wires. You've seen me solder dropper wires under a baseboard before, for example in this video that I'm linking here. So let's cut to afterwards. Totally not because the battery died in the camera, nope not at all. I still need to insulate the connections but the block wires are now in from the three blocks back to the electronics panel. Three channels of this DTC-8A are used to detect occupancy, and four channels of the asymmetric braking controller are implemented here. Two channels in the red wire for movement in one direction, and two in the black wire for movement in the other direction. The servos are also connected in now with extensions. This isn't the best cable routing, but they're the longest extensions I've got and they're out of the way for now and this saves me daisy chaining multiple extensions together.
This is the first iteration of the panel. I'll be continuing to work on this and add the missing features like signals and NX buttons, but it's good enough to operate the turnouts and see the block detection working. Changing the points shows the servo running between endpoints, with the blades tight against the stock rails both ways and the micro switches being operated. There's also no labouring against the ends, so the servo is reaching its programmed endpoint. Do let me know in the comments section below if you want to see more about configuring JMRI and how I set it up to do NX routing. I can do a video on that later if people are interested. The correct blocks are lighting up as occupied as my test coach moves around, and there are no angry booster noises indicating a short when it goes across the diamond. To test this any more thoroughly will require some more track to lead into and away from this junction, but that's going to be the subject of a featured video. See you next time up here in the study at Dongit's Model Railway.